This Viewfinder episode is supported by UC Davis Health, where doctors, nurses, researchers, and staff share a passion for advancing health. Learn more about their latest medical innovations at health.ucdavis.edu. I would go to bed and there were nights I would lay there and lay there and lay there. I got to the point where I hated that clock. My mind just would not quit. Uh, as a matter of fact, it would take any excuse to get busy. Chronic insomnia can turn us into zombies, moving blurry-eyed through the day and threatening our health. Heart attacks, diabetes, etc., they're all influenced by lack of sleep. In this program, we'll look into some of the treatments and techniques to battle insomnia. We'll also explore other sleep disorders like narcolepsy, restless legs, and obstructive sleep apnea. I woke up in the middle of the night gasping for air. And a disorder that comes with frightening hallucinations. You feel like you're going to die, like something's just going to suck you up or, or kill you. The latest research and the newest treatments to help us better understand and fight back against the range of disorders that keep too many of us sleep deprived. We spend one third of our lives sleeping, about 25 years in bed. But it wasn't until the last few decades that new light has been shed on just how crucial sleep is to every aspect of our lives. The purpose of sleep is maintenance work. Your alertness, your memory, your problem solving skills, your mood, your blood pressure, your blood sugar, your hormones, your sex drive, your weight, your food cravings, your immune system, uh, aches and pains, inflammation, pretty much every system in the body depends on this maintenance work being done. Not getting enough sleep is devastating to your health. Routinely sleeping less than six to seven hours a night wrecks your immune system. It increases your risk for heart disease, obesity, and cancer. Fatigue can also be deadly. Every hour, someone dies of a fatigue-related traffic accident, a fear that Stacy Ryerson harbored for years. I worried about my falling asleep and all of us dying in a fireball on the freeway. I could have the radio on, the air conditioning, the windows rolled down, and I get to the point where I can feel my eyes starting to bob, and it's like, I can't drive anymore. When Stacy's kids were in elementary school, she often drove from their home in the foothills to visit family in the Bay Area. But she got so tired, she had to stop at gas stations to nap along the way. Fearing a car crash, she went to a doctor in the 1990s who diagnosed Stacy with insomnia. Chronic insomnia causes people to feel tired, fatigued, maybe sleepy. They can't focus, they have no energy. You would think that they would be so tired or sleepy they'd be able to sleep when they go to bed but it actually doesn't work that way. It's the nighttime comes and for whatever their underlying process is, they don't sleep. I hated going to bed at night. That bed was not my friend because I was so aware of the tossing and the turning and, and watching the time tick away and so desperately wanting to sleep and not being able to. Stacy's doctor prescribed doxepin, an antidepressant that's also used for insomnia. Before bed, she makes herself a glass of warm milk and takes her pill, finally winding down with a mellow TV show to quiet her busy mind. I'm always asleep within about 15 to 30 minutes. I am so appreciative of the doctor that I had that suggested it for me I, because honestly, I just don't know. I don't know if I would have lived to make it this far. Dr. Kimberly Harden of UC Davis says that medication is often the last step doctors take to treat insomnia. Hey guys, how's it going today? Those medications can be for anxiety or depression with the side effect of sedation. You're treating the underlying disorder that's unmasked as insomnia. Dr. Harden says the first step is to teach people about good sleep hygiene. That means having a cool bedroom between 60 to 67 degrees, regular bedtimes and waking times, even on the weekends, avoiding heavy meals in the evenings, 
and exposing yourself to natural sunlight as well as darkness each day. If that doesn't work, then we do other options such as sleep restriction. Your logic would say that, oh, well, if I can't sleep, let me spend more time in bed. Let me extend that opportunity for sleep. When in fact, the way in which to fix that, that problem is to actually restrict the sleep. Dr. Matthew Chow put Sharon Fink on sleep restriction when she suddenly developed insomnia at the age of 75. I just wouldn't sleep. I'd get in bed and I'd be wide awake and hyper and it's like I had a full pot of coffee. On sleep restriction, Sharon wasn't allowed to go to bed until one in the morning. The idea is to use your natural sleep drive to get you to sleep faster and deeper. Over time, you slowly revert to a normal bedtime. It improves slightly, but not enough. And when I went to, to go see him again for my recheck, he said, Sharon, we have to do something else. That something else is an emerging trend in sleep medicine. It's called Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia, or CBTI. Sharon was referred to Dr. Daniel Jin Blum, a psychologist and author in San Francisco who specializes in CBTI therapy, done mostly through telemedicine calls. Hi. How's it going? I'm great. How are you? Thank you for sending your sleep logs. I've got oh. to take a look at those. Yeah, good. I thought you might be interested in that to see, you know, the improvement. Mm -hmm. CBTI is a six to eight week treatment that focuses on uh, the mechanisms of sleep and helps people provide that fundamental understanding of how their sleep wake mechanisms work and then give them the tools to uh, change that in a way that allows them to fall asleep quickly and stay asleep. Uh, it sounds like on that hyperarousal scale you're probably at like four maybe, between three and four? Yeah, that's what I was guessing, yeah. And here's the good thing, I had no intention of going in and getting an Ambien. I mean, there was there was not even a thought in my mind, it didn't matter. Wow. So, yeah. I, when I first started talking to I Dr. Blum, he showed me all these tools. Um, my sleep diary, every morning, without fail, I get on there and I record what I've done the previous night, whether I've slept all night or whether I got up three or four times or whether I didn't sleep at all. And it all re it records the whole thing. I uh, usually have people do that for at least one week, but often two weeks to get a good baseline. And this will then inform our treatment. Oftentimes we start with the behavioral interventions like sleep restriction or stimulus control. And as we go along, we'll also start to introduce more cognitive exercises, so ways to work with a mind that just starts to run getting into bedtime or in the middle of the night being able to move those thoughts in a constructive way towards earlier in the day, and also look at some relaxation and uh, mindfulness strategies. By the time we had like three conversations, I said, well, I know everything that I'm supposed to know, just, you know, I'll keep applying it and see if it helps, and it did. I mean, I feel like a real person again. I, I have the energy that I was pretending to have before. We have kayaks, and so we, we kayak, you know, I connect with my friends. Now it's, let's go out and do something. Open up your senses to everything happening in your mind, your body, and our immediate surroundings. Dr. Amer Khan also uses CBTI techniques at his practice in Roseville called Sehatu Sleep. Every day he offers this 30-minute guided meditation session to his patients. When I got into sleep medicine, my focus was on finding out how I can best help them without making them dependent on these medicines. The medical profession has become more and more aware of how uh, sleeping pills of different kinds, whether they're over-the-counter or prescription, how they affect people in the long run. Problems like memory, issues and early onset of dementia. So another way of handling the problem is, why don't we help you learn how to calm your mind down, relax, and be able to go to sleep? Watching peaceful waves coming to the shore. I started out with over-the-counter uh, uh, drugs uh, that would help me to uh, get to sleep. Eventually, the over-the-counter drugs no longer worked. I've been through Ambien, I've been through Lanesta. But one of the problems with um, uh, sleep medications is that they stop being effective, and you have to go stronger. Uh, most recently, I've been on Temazepam, but I don't want to be on the drugs. I want to be off. 
Studies have found that pill-induced sleep doesn't produce the same large, deep brain waves found in natural sleep. Natural deep sleep cements memories and builds your immune system, raising concerns that people using sleeping pills are missing out on these benefits. That's, that's the underlying problem with, with using any sort of medication for this problem. It works up front, it works for an amount of time, but the same problems that got you into having insomnia are still there, but now I have to take this thing also. A couple thousand years ago, people still experienced the issue of insomnia. They either hooked on to some sort of a chemical, so which would be alcohol or opium, that they would use to knock themselves out so that they could go to sleep. Or they would learn and practice some sort of a meditation ritual. What I do in my sleep therapy group classes, these are repetitive relaxation techniques. And I use a, a phrase that I think helps a lot, which is to be able to let things be. That is a basic requirement of being able to go to sleep. There are lots of benefits from it. I have cut my sleep medications in half. Before I, I started these sessions, it was so stressful that the whole day I was off. Now, just the, the technique of, of going through and doing a, a personal assessment of myself and the couple of deep breaths, that really works to let the brain relax and let it be. Aside from insomnia, one of the next most common sleep disorders is obstructive sleep apnea. It causes breathing to stop and start during sleep. LaShawn Cobb didn't know she was having trouble breathing at night until her children told her. We all went to a hotel one time. We stayed out of town and we all stayed in the same room and I was breathing really loud or snoring really loud and they said that I stopped breathing in my sleep and they were like, what's going on? And they woke me up like, are you okay? It, they're pretty scared about it. LaShawn doesn't fit into your typical demographic for sleep apnea. It's largely found in men over 50 who are overweight or have a large neck circumference. But she does suffer one major symptom, excessive daytime sleepiness. I'm tired throughout the whole day and I'm easily able to fall asleep. The patient may say, well, I sleep fine. I'm, I'm not having any problems sleeping. So I'm sent here because my wife or my husband or my whoever says I snore too much. But then when you talk to them more, you find out that, oh yeah, I kind of doze off when I am on Highway 5, particularly in the evening. That is not normal. To determine if LaShawn really does have sleep apnea, she's participating in an overnight sleep study at UC Davis. She arrives at 8 in the evening and will stay until she's woken up at 5 the next morning. LaShawn is outfitted with several sensors applied to her scalp, chin, legs, and chest to measure brain waves and movement during sleep. She's also wearing belts that will monitor her breathing. Because LaShawn has suspected sleep apnea, she's also fitted for a CPAP machine in case she'll need it tonight. CPAP stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. This is basically a glorified air compressor, uh, which delivers a certain pressure via a mask to the face to essentially tent open the airway and prevent those obstructions. That's the gold standard, and it's very effective. However, some people don't like having to wear a mask, although now there are masks out there that are very uninvasive, even as small as like a, a larger nasal cannula. How was that? Was it okay? Not too bad? Not too bad. Okay. LaShawn falls asleep quickly. Nicole immediately notices that she's having frequent respiratory events. Some people that have severe sleep apnea, they can experience it up to 60 times an hour and have respiratory events that actually wake them up and they have little arousals throughout the night, but they may not remember it. But it does disrupt their sleep, so when they wake up in the morning, they don't feel refreshed like they should. After I went to sleep, 
I guess they noticed that my breathing was not right. So they put the CPAP machine back on me and I slept throughout the night with the machine on. It wasn't uncomfortable at all. I was able to sleep through the night and not wake up at all. And I felt well rested when I woke up in the morning. Fortunately, LaShawn can tolerate the CPAP machine, but many other people struggle to wear their CPAPs at night. There are other treatments called an oral appliance. They're made by a dentist that treat people who have a little bit milder sleep apnea. There are other treatments called EPAP, which is just expiratory positive pressure that can fit just in the nose. They look like fancy little round band-aids. Position pillows such as a bumper belt. We have a new type device that's called the hypoglossal nerve stimulator. I call this a fancy pacemaker of the tongue and that's what it is. And then of course we start getting into more advanced type things of surgery. Surgery was the route Dr. Blum chose when he discovered he had sleep apnea. They cut the top jaw and slide it forward and attach it with plates and then same with the bottom jaw uh, just to create more space in your mouth. I can see firsthand how beneficial it can be. That's also why I'm in this field. There's very viable treatments out there. There are more than 100 sleep disorders, but perhaps none is as frightening as sleep paralysis. The first time I experienced sleep paralysis, I, my parents were sleeping, I had gotten into bed, I had just laid down, and I had this feeling that something was in the room with me, and then all of a sudden I couldn't move, I couldn't scream, I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. And I kept hearing this something whispering my name. Donna Wilberg was 17 when she had that first experience of sleep paralysis. It's a parasomnia that occurs when there's a blurring between wakefulness and REM sleep. REM stands for rapid eye movement. And it's a stage of sleep when we often dream. Our bodies are paralyzed during this stage to prevent us from acting out our dreams. During sleep paralysis, you may feel awake, but immobile and experience hallucinations. If someone were to say, what does evil feel like? It feels like that. About 10% of the population has periodic uh, sleep paralysis at least once or twice in their life where they may have uh, awoken where they can't move. Descriptions of sleep paralysis date back hundreds of years in countries all over the world. People almost always describe an evil being or a demon. They may feel a crushing weight on their chest or an ominous figure in the room. You, you feel like it's, it's something so evil and who's gonna help you? You know, but God, you know, I pray to God. I pray, you know, somebody help me. Donna is an author who's written a trilogy of crime novels a career partly inspired by the vision she experiences in sleep paralysis. I remember we were living in this house. I lay down in bed, and next thing I knew, I was pressed to the bed, couldn't move, and I heard and I saw this sickle just swinging back and forth, coming after me, and I'm screaming, and I'm praying, stop this, this is too close, and I'm, I'm the more, the closer I got, the more frightening I, it was for me and it's gone. The older I get, the more frightening it is, and I feel I'm gonna have a heart attack because your heart's pounding so hard that, you know, it's, it's possible. One of the experiences I had, I went to bed, it was like nine o'clock, and I got in bed and I had just laid down, and all of a sudden, I couldn't move. And I saw this figure and Around the figure, it was just this beautiful blue color, and this figure is talking to me in another language. And I'm saying, I can't understand you. You're gonna have to speak to me in English. And he said, you're not ready for me yet. And then I, it just dissipated. I've had some patients who didn't want to tell anybody because they thought that someone would think that they were crazy, but they're not. Sleep paralysis is usually harmless, but if it happens frequently enough, it could be a sign that you have narcolepsy. 
Brandon Tim has had sleep paralysis since he was young. It wasn't until he was in nursing school, though, that he discovered he was dealing with narcolepsy, a sleep disorder that caused him to uncontrollably fall asleep during the day. Even though I, d you know, did sleep, would wake up, would still be tired, it just, it was started spiraling. And it just took a while to get some, get to the bottom of it. But basically during that time, it just got to a point where my life was out of control. Narcolepsy is probably an under-recognized disorder, particularly young people, which is when narcolepsy tends to declare itself. So if you're 20 years old and you didn't have sleep problems really in your life and you're now having trouble in school and you're just absolutely falling asleep at the drop of your hat, uh, that's not normal. They would also oftentimes have what's called cataplexy if it's a narcolepsy type 1, which is this experience of a loss of muscle tone. Another symptom of narcolepsy is uh, having sleep attacks, which is the experience of being awake and the next thing you know, you're remembering from waking up from just having been asleep. When Brandon feels a sleep attack coming on, he says it's like a storm. He only has about 15 minutes to find a place to lay down. All of a sudden, my brain just goes, <laughs> and sentences and words will come out funny. And then, next thing you know, it's like you've been blacked out. Brandon was put on what he describes as a yo-yo of medications, including sleeping pills and stimulants. But he wanted to stop, so a sleep doctor suggested scheduling daily naps. You're actually telling me I have to have naps as my treatment. Once I learned about naps, then yeah, I was able to step away from medicine. Brandon now takes as many as four naps a day, each lasting about 15 minutes. He's also found that keeping physically fit ensures that he has good quality of sleep at night. And finally, he's shifting careers to pursue farming so he can someday open his own business, a goal that will give him complete control over his schedule. I've been diagnosed with narcolepsy, but I still get to control the outcome in the end. It's not defining me. Hello. Dr. Mark Bookfuhrer is one of the top experts in the country when it comes to restless leg syndrome, a disorder with a perception problem. There's a lot of jokes by comedians about restless legs, and uh, it's misconstrued as just being an issue that doesn't really deserve treatment or shouldn't be a true medical disorder. But if you speak to a patient who's had severe restless legs, this can be a terrible disorder. There's a lot of feelings that you're alone and that you're, that it's just really psychological. It isn't truly a physical disorder, but let me tell you it is. Sandra Aberer has suffered with restless legs since high school. Her symptoms change from time to time. Sometimes it's an itching, sometimes it feels like there are bugs crawling up and down your legs. Sometimes it's just an incredibly cold feeling that wakes you up and there's an urge to move and you can't stop it. Because it occurs around bedtime, you can't fall asleep, so it becomes a sleep disorder. You can't even relax in bed, you have to walk around. So not only do you get the sleep deprivation, but you can't even rest. It is miserable. Dr. Bookfuhrer holds a restless leg clinic once a month at Stanford. He tells patients if they feel an attack coming on, get up and move immediately to try to prevent it. Taking iron supplements can help, and so can using a vibrating pad for your legs. There are also approved drugs, but a few of them come with serious drawbacks. The issue we have with these short-acting drugs is that they work great initially, and patients get incredible relief. But over the years, they actually get a worsening of restless legs from taking those drugs, which is called augmentation. Once those patients are in augmentation, Dr. Bookfuhrer says one of the only things that works for severe cases is an opioid treatment. He very early on said, I think you need to use some opioids. And I said, I don't want to take those opioids. So we tried ever so many different things. And finally he said, give this a try. And I've done it, and it is working. These drugs are very potent drugs. 
have to be given very carefully and we certainly don't want to add to the opioid epidemic. However, if done correctly under supervision of a doctor, this can actually be done very, very safely. In the past, we'd be driving home at night and I'd be almost in tears trying to sit in the car, but now it's under control. I'm able to go to the movies, I'm able to go to plays, lectures, and enjoy life. Both Sandra and Dr. Buchfuhrer say they want to spread the word about restless leg syndrome, not just to the public, but also to the medical community. There's many patients who just think they have to suffer with it, but they don't. Even for those of us without sleep disorders, it's important to create good habits for sleep, like setting aside 30 minutes a day before bedtime to deal with worrisome thoughts, or going outside. Simple strategies proven to improve sleep. We are uh, a very high stress society, and that is probably one of the downfalls for us. You have to have mental relaxation and physical relaxation. Parks, where you can go and you can walk, Meditation, yoga, PE for kids is something that really needs to be reinstituted in the schools. When that's done, then usually people will feel better, they sleep better, they'll have more energy to do more, and the more they do, then it becomes a compounding effect overall. This Viewfinder episode is supported by UC Davis Health, where doctors, nurses, researchers, and staff share a passion for advancing health. Learn more about their latest medical innovations at health.ucdavis.edu.